and yet Cardinal Antonelli still voted for the Concordat. Its saving grace was that it restored free worship in France. A properly constituted clergy and papal power. Despite serious material losses, in fact, the papacy was one of the great gainers from the work of the revolution. In the 1780s, it had appeared an institution in perhaps terminal decline, scorned by secularizing monarchs and defied in Germany and Italy by Jansenizing bishops. Its apparent helplessness did much to mislead the drafters of the civil constitution, but before the end of the 1790s, The Holy Father himself was sharing in the glory of martyrdom visited on his fellow priests by a godless republic and its sympathizers abroad. The vast majority of the population was showing itself loyal to a clergy which had rejected the revolution on his instructions. These were facts which the first consul of France had the perception and the courage to recognize against the advice and inclination of most of those who had tried to manage France's affairs throughout the 1790s. Instant harmony did not follow. Within a few years, he would find himself as exasperated as any Jacobin at priestly wiles. But he never tried to undo the basic settlement of 1801, and the clergy restored then stripped of indefensible excrescences and abuses, now for the first time ever devoted almost all of its energy to the cure of souls. Under Rome's unchallengeable doctrinal and spiritual authority. Not that they thanked the revolution for all this, as in the case of the nobility. The experience from which it had arisen was altogether too painful. Throughout the 19th century, the Roman Catholic Church would anathemas, anathematize the French Revolution and all its works as an outburst of atheistical excess fomented by malignant philosophers and scheming Freemasons, lending its full authority to the unhistorical ravings of Barul. Republicans, in turn, whose convictions were rooted in the revolution, would see the church as their most formidable foe and join Masonic lodges to express their antagonism. Nothing but the complete separation of church and state between 1794 and 1802 would allay their suspicions. In 1905, it was eventually brought about after decades of mounting extremism on both sides, all traceable back, ultimately, to 1790.
also traceable back to that fateful divide was the breaking of the church's hold on the two social services it had controlled throughout the old order, education and poor relief. The men of 1789 saw education as yet another area to be regenerated on rational lines. Grandiose schemes were mooted throughout the 1790s, including one drafted by the last of the philosophes, the philosophes, Condorcet, in 1792. But other priorities repeatedly postponed practical action. Meanwhile, the existing system fell to pieces. Although lands owned by educational institutions were at first exempted from nationalization, other sources of support, such as impropriated tithes and standard donations from chapters and monasteries, dried up. Clerical teachers refusing the oath were dismissed. Those who took it were often called away to become parish priests. Teaching orders, such as the Oratorians, at first escaped the revolution's attack on monasticism. But in August 1792, suspicion of all priests in positions of influence was such that they were dissolved. Finally, even lands owned by schools and colleges were swallowed up as national property of a republic desperate for resources in March 1793. Not until 1802 were comprehensive measures taken to fill the vacuum thus created, even though the Constitution of 1793 had declared education to be among basic human rights. that of 1795 made no such rash commitment. And although the directory set up a central school in each department and established a number of higher schools in Paris to replace the universities abolished by the convention as bastions of corporatism, it left primary education to local initiative and made no public financial provision for it. Bedeviled at every level by a shortage of trained teachers, clerics being too dangerous to entrust with the education of Republican youth, the revolution itself the fruit of unprecedented educational advance created chaos in education and a marked drop in numbers undergoing it, whereas 50,000 pupils were attending colleges in 1789. Only 12,000 or 14,000 were in the central schools a decade later basic literacy fell from 37% in 1789 to more like 30% in 1815. In the field of poor relief, the record was even bleaker. Again, there was no shortage of reforming intentions and be in bold projects to tackle a problem which everybody could see. In the 1780s, 
was getting worse. The Constituent Assembly set up a committee on mendicity which collected impressive information on the scale of the problem. The legislative established its own committee. And in its brief existence, passed no less than 56 decrees in the area of poor relief. Every citizen in need, declared the Constitution of 1793, had a right to public support, and in May 1794, a great book of national benevolence was instituted where deserving cases could register their needs. Two months earlier, a comprehensive law on poor relief had been passed which, among other things, forbade private alms giving on the grounds that the state would now provide. In October came the corollary. Begging was too, what begging too was forbidden. Some of these measures would have been rashly ambitious at the best of times. In a country desperately at war and diverting all available resources towards fighting it, they were practically meaningless. In some districts, local authorities made heroic efforts to establish the Great Book. But under the directory, the project was abandoned. Yet by then, the problem was far worse than it had been in 1789. The poor were far more numerous, thanks to the economic disruption which six years of upheaval had brought about. In previous provision, inadequate though it obviously was, had been shattered by the attack on the church. Monastic charity dried up when church lands were nationalized and houses dissolved. Parish-based relief largely derived from endowments and pious donations, was disrupted by the schism among parish priests over the oath. And those with money to give closed their purses for fear of drawing envious attention to themselves. In the last resorts of the indigent hospitals and poorhouses, <clears throat> had their already overstretched resources piteously blighted by almost every wave of revolutionary legislation, like schools and colleges. Many lost important sources of income in the reforms of 4th August 1789. Fiscal changes which abolished municipal tolls took away others. <clears throat> the value of investments was slashed by the inflation which had taken hold by 1792. And institutions which depended on direct grants from the crown found the National Assembly unwilling to continue them. Like teaching orders, the charitable ones who were the 
backbone of the nursing in the hospitals were at first exempted from dissolution and from the oath. But as in teaching too, it did not last. And by 1792, the piety with which nuns ministered to the poor was viewed with suspicion by patriots. They were not allowed to recruit novices, and in October 1793, they were at last subjected to a clerical oath. Those who refused were arrested and imprisoned. Despite the clear impossibility of obtaining adequate replacements, a final blow came when in July 1794, Hospital property was nationalized in this way. The old structure of charity was pulled apart and, for all the talk, nothing constructive put in its place under the directory, all thought national provision was abandoned. Nevertheless, after 1794, some recovery began. The sale of hospital lands was halted, and those still unsold returned. Imprisoned nuns were released and resumed their ministrations. Rich laymen who had played a crucial part in fundraising and management before 1789, re-emerged gingerly to take on something like their old coordinating roles. Local taxes and surcharges on luxuries like theater tickets were also reintroduced as a means of subsidizing hospitals. In Napoleonic France, all these trends would be officially fostered and charitable giving would revive. But pre-revolutionary levels were not restored. Even by 1847, the number of hospitals in France for a population seven millions higher was still almost 42 percent less than in 1789. Nobody, therefore, suffered more than the poor and the sick. Overall, several generations from the blind destruction of established institutions before viable alternatives had been devised and funded. In no sphere was more human damage done by the French Revolutionary's failure to match rhetoric with reality. It is true that their difficulties, here and elsewhere, were compounded by severe economic problems. In fact, the revolution was an economic disaster for France, but much of that was the revolutionary's own doing too. The revolution broke out at a moment of rare economic crisis in this circumstance it was to affect its whole subsequent character. Much of the boundless, unrealistic hope invested in the Estates General by all classes in the spring of 1789, which did so much to ensure the success of the third estate sprang from anxieties aroused by the harvest failure of 1788. A harsh winter, 
rising prices and the slump in demand from manufacturers, popular support for the patriotic cause in Paris in July was based on the assumption that under the new regime there would be guaranteed supplies of cheap bread. In the eyes of the sans-culotte, failure to achieve this would mean betrayal of the revolution. Their determination to maintain it would constrain the economic policies of successive revolutionary assemblies down to 1795. Even when their power was broken, no government was unpragmatic enough to leave the provisioning of Paris to the free market forces in which almost all men of education believed in principle. Finally, the concessions made on 4th of August 1789 to appease a peasantry paranoid with fear for the safety of the harvest would become, despite the assembly's initial misgivings, central to the revolution's anti-feudal ideology. Left to itself, once the good harvest of 1789 was in, the economy might have been expected to improve. But almost at once, its development began to be affected by revolutionary legislation. The first series of disruptions resulted from the losses sustained by the nobility and the clergy. The destruction of a privileged society setting a high value on services could scarcely be brought about without serious shock waves which reached far beyond the immediate sufferers. Faced with the loss of feudal revenues, which in some regions might constitute as much as 20% of landlords' income their immediate reaction was to raise rents. In December 1790, proprietors were specifically authorized to add the equivalent of the abolished tithe to the rents they charged. On some estates by 1791, the notional rental had risen by a quarter it was no coincidence that the most persistent peasant resistance to the revolution came in areas where leaseholders predominated. The disappearance of the aristocratic lifestyle also had serious repercussions. For a town like Versailles, the shock was brutal and irreparable as the English visitors haunting its abandoned, crumbling glories found in 1802. Formerly fashionable parts of Paris suffered a similar fate. The Faubourg Saint-Germain can never recover, wrote an unduly pessimistic diplomatic visitor in 1796. It was quite depopulated, its hotels almost all seized by gunmen, and the streets near the boulevard are choked with weeds. 
in every city where a parliament had sat, or provincial estates regularly convened, found its economy rocked when these institutions disappeared and their rich and noble members immigrated or shrank into unostentatious obscurity. The spoliation of the church compounded such problems. Monasteries, chapters, and cathedrals provided innumerable jobs for the laity, directly or indirectly, from builders and painters all the way to washerwomen keeping surplices clean. All were now lost as these institutions were deprived of their property, their revenues, and ultimately their very existence. Servants were dismissed wholesale. In Bayeux, for example, the nobility and clergy had employed 467 between them in 1787. Nine years later, they only gave employment to 76. The luxury trades were also devastated by the disappearance of their main customers and the introduction of simpler fashions that went with it. The silk capital of Lyon, already in difficulties before the revolution, found the 1790s as disturbed economically as they were politically. Between 1790 and 1806, its population fell by almost a third, from 146,000 to 100,000. Between 1789 in 1799, the number of silk workshops fell by more than half. Many of these convulsions were the consequence, ultimately, of the massive land transfer, which proved one of the revolution's most enduring achievements. But the use to which nationalized property was put created its own range of difficulties in the form of the inflation of the Asinats. Convinced by the physiocratic nostrum that the land was the only true source of wealth, the members of the National Assembly were only too willing to believe that a paper money based on land was more secure than the disastrous still-remembered notes issued by John Law in 1720. And so it might have been if the Asinats had not been massively overissued and had been withdrawn in an orderly way, as originally envisaged. But their minds set firmly against any forced reduction of the debt inherited from the monarchy on the one hand, and lacking both the power and the will to raise taxes and enforce their collection firmly on the other, the revolutionaries found the temptation to print money too strong. Already by January 1792, over issue had brought down the value of the Asinat by 28%. And once war began, financed as it had to be until 1794, largely by France's own resources, There was little alternative but to go on. In all, a nominal 45 billion livres worth of paper was issued between 1790 and 1797, but its 
total real value at 1790 prices was less than a seventh of that. And three quarters of the depreciation over that time can be convincingly attributed to overissue. The consequences affected every area of the economy. Thanks to the inflation, even the sale of national lands, which was supposed to underpin the whole operation, only realized 25% of these lands' true value. Until the deflation of 1798, Revolutionary France was a debtor's paradise, since Asinats were legal tender at face value, as one of their easiest opponents had predicted. Every man in France who owes nothing, and to whom everything is owing, will be ruined by paper money. Paradise for debtors was a hell for creditors. It was no atmosphere for business confidence, and outside the black market and the enforced activity of war industries, normal production and exchange stagnated for much of the 1790s. Credit was tight, interest rates usurously high, cash was hoarded, and what little could be extracted had to be spent on dealings with foreigners who refused to accept French paper. Wage earners and all those on fixed incomes found their resources catastrophically eroded and although wages eventually had to rise in the face of four-figure increases in the cost of living they seldom caught up. Few rises equaled the 3,000% achieved by government employees between 1790 and 1797. Government was the only employer whose demand for labor grew steadily throughout the revolution. Others faced with shrinking markets and spiraling costs cut back and laid their workers off. By 1798, there were 60,000 unemployed in Paris, a tenth of the city's population. There were clear links between such employment, unemployment and the rise in crime, which everybody commented on under the directory. Not to mention a marked increase in urban suicide. There was no longer after all, even the former network of charitable institutions to fall back on. It was the war of course, which finally made the country hostage to the Asinats. Although the preposterous Brissot had actually claimed on the last day of 1791 that war would eliminate the depreciation that had already occurred, and war was also so responsible for perhaps the most permanent chain damage suffered by the French economy under the revolution. The destruction of overseas trade. Before 1789, it had been the most glitteringly successful sector. Unlike the others, it felt few shocks in the revolution's early stages. The trade of Bordeaux and Marseille peaked in 1791, but that year also saw the outbreak 
of the Great Slave Rebellion in San Domingo, where an increasing proportion of the colonial trade of Bordeaux, at least, was concentrated. It developed into a full-scale civil war, which could not have failed to disrupt trade in the Caribbean, whatever happened. Then, in 1793, came war against most of Europe and, most ominously of all, against Great Britain. The French coast was now blockaded and to compound the chaos. In August, the convention banned export of all goods of first necessity and embargoed all neutral ships. By the time these restrictions were lifted a year later, the British had tightened their grip and they dominated the Atlantic approaches at least for the rest of the decade. The trade of the ports was not reduced to nothing and in privateering they found a new resource. But their colonial business was largely destroyed in the boom times of before 1789 were lost forever. Foreign trade shrank from 25% of the country's economic activity to just 9% in seven years. The population of Marseille fell between 1790 and 1806 from 120,000 to 99,000 that of Bordeaux from 110,000 to 92,000, that of Nantes from perhaps 90,000 to 77,000. This collapse <clears throat> of what had been the unchallenged leading sector of the old regime economy proved a permanent structural shift. It was accentuated by the captive continental markets conquered by France in the later 1790s and retained in various guises until 1804. 1814, international commerce reoriented itself away from the sea towards continental markets, where French power was increasingly successful in excluding British competition too. For those able to take advantage of such changing circumstances, the revolutionary years were not without their opportunities. War industries, of course, did well. Munitions, metallurgy, and even woolen textiles meeting an unprecedented demand for uniforms. The mines and woolen towns of Belgium incorporated into the French national market from 1795 boomed at the expense of older centers in France proper. And the revival of the French cotton industry was almost a success story. Mortally challenged in the late 1780s by the cheaper, better quality products of a technologically more advanced Lancashire which flooded into the country under the ill-conceived commercial treaty of 1786. French cottons were saved from annihilation by renewed conflict with Great Britain. The population of Rouen, the cotton capital, actually grew despite the loss of a parliament important ecclesiastical institutions in maritime trade. After 1796, much new machinery was introduced, although only of a sort used across the channel for decades and already being superseded there. In the first decade of the 19th century, French cottons would boom under the impetus of a revival of luxury fashions and continued exclusion 
a British competition. In fact, traumatic though it was for those who had to live through it, much of the economic upheaval of the 1790s proved transitory. Lyon recovered when silk came back into fashion. Even overseas trade clawed itself back to the volume of 1789. But in both these areas, pre-revolutionary levels were not reached again until the 1830s. And that was typical. The revolutionary years had set French economic expansion back by at least a generation. And had done little to make structures more dynamic. Certain preconditions for later progress had indeed been established. Internal customs barriers had been eliminated. Standardized weights and measures introduced. Guild restrictive practices abolished. And labor organizations restricted by the Le Chapelier Law. But none of this released entrepreneurial energy of itself. The hideous uncertainties of the 1790s did quite the reverse. Spectacular fortunes were made by shrewd speculators and military supply contractors, particularly under the directory. But most of those with money to invest hastened to sink it into the one security that was no risk land. It was very much the pattern of pre-revolutionary times. And the revolution accentuated it by removing what before had been a uniquely French alternative, venal office. At the same time, it placed unprecedented amounts of new land on the market when it offered the property of the church and the emigres for sale. In unbargained terms, thus the long-standing tendency of the French bourgeoisie to shun commercial investment or get out of it as soon as possible was reinforced and would persist far into the 19th century. Nor did the revolution bring any market changes in the cultivation of the land. Benefits derived from the abolition of feudal burdens were largely offset by higher rents and taxes. <coughs> Revolutionary legislation reinforced rather than inhibited the division of properties on inheritance, ensuring that most holdings remain small. Inflation increased the appeal of sharecropping, also already so well established. Military requirements were a constant drain on livestock. Wasting its precious manure while conscription or its evasion, the effect was the same, decimated the most able-bodied of the workforce. By 1802, it is true, French agriculture was managing to feed over a million more mouths a substantial achievement, especially given the deterioration in transport networks. But apart from an acceleration in the spread of potatoes, no innovations underlay this increase in capacity. The reliability of an expanding market might even have discouraged risky experiments. Even in the 1840s, the patterns and basic productivity of French agriculture were much what they had been a century beforehand. Only with the advent of the railways 
did fundamental change begin? Here, as in much of the rest of the French economy, was then the revolution worth it in material terms? For most ordinary French subjects turned by it into citizens, it cannot have been. It had made their lives infinitely more precarious when they had expected the reverse. It had bidden fair to destroy the religious, cultural, and moral underpinnings of the communities in which they lived. The Cahiers of 1789 made overwhelmingly clear that most French people wanted less state interference in their lives, yet it brought far more and fiercer. Government by terror scarcely outlasted the year number two, but nothing like it had ever occurred before when it ebbed, the power of the state remained. Permanently augmented and disposing of coercive powers not dreamed of by the old monarchy. It was no wonder, therefore, that the most persistent and massive resistance that the revolution encountered came not from the former so-called privileged orders, but from ordinary people who simply wanted to call a halt in alienating so many of their fellow citizens, the revolutionaries furnished counter-revolutionaries with constant hope and encouragement. But most popular resistance was anti rather than counter revolutionary. Though they might mouth the slogans about restoring church and king, all most anti revolutionaries wanted was stability and autonomy after years of upheaval and intrusion by outsiders. Their resistance, however, only too often pushed France's new authorities to further extremes of repression, gouging existing wounds yet wider and deeper. Popular rejection of what the revolution had become was not confined to the open rebellion of the Vendée or even to the recurrent Chouannerie of Brittany Maine and Western Normandy, where the bonds of village communities had been severed by the impact of the new religious policy on regions where even the abolition of feudalism had brought few gains to peasants who were predominantly renters. It was endemic throughout the South where the revolution was perceived as designed to benefit rich protestants and broke out periodically in rioting on local issues in many other areas. The statistics of immigration and terror are also suggestive. Almost 32,000, a third of all registered emigres were peasants or workers turning their backs on the land of liberty. of the official victims of the terror. 8,350, or almost 60% were from the same groups 
dying for their resistance. Deserters or draft dodgers, tellingly defined as insubordinate, were another gauge. In 1789, dr drawing for the militia, one of the most hated institutions of the old order had been abolished. By 1793, it was back. And in 1798, conscription assumed a far more systematic character. Evasion of military service was universally agreed to be a major ingredient in the rural crime wave, which marked the directorial period. Many deserters are lurking about the woods, wrote an English traveler through Chantilly in 1796. And there are continual robberies and murders. We have not traveled half an hour in the dark. Banditti, he called them later on, bandits, a category social scientists have learned to recognize as a classic form of protest against an established order. Anti-revolution, in other words, was a popular movement, far more so than that of the sans-culottes, who have usually monopolized this description. Yet, there is a sense in which the sans-culottes were anti-revolutionary too. They shared none of the economic liberalism of the men of 1789 and none of their extreme commitment to the rights of property. Their belief was in a moral, not a market economy. And they were prepared to offer armed resistance to those like the Girondins, who were overt in rejecting Dave's ideals. Their belief in popular democracy and mistrust for the rich and overeducated paralleled peasant antagonism towards well-off urban patriots who intruded into largely self-governing village communities with their purchases of national lands and client constitutional priests. Sans culotte welcomed the revolution because they knew that in the last years the monarchy had begun to turn its back on time-honored moral commitments towards its subjects. So long as their energies could be usefully harnessed, those in power accepted and paid lip service to their support. But most deputies never accepted the legitimacy of the sans culot claim to dictate the course of national policy, and they sanctioned the popular savagery of terror and dechristianization with ill-conceived reluctance. As soon as they could, they shrugged off popular tutelage. And by 1795, were openly, openly treating the remaining militants of Paris as anti-revolutionaries. By then, the latter had one more thing in common with others elsewhere who opposed it. They had no gains to show, either for all the upheaval and disruption. Yet some groups undoubtedly gained. In any list of them, pride of place must go to the owners of land. Freed in August 1789 from the burdens of feudalism and the tithe, they were able to proclaim property as the supreme social and political commodity. The civil code, when it was completed, 
consolidated and clarified their rights and the means of transmitting them. Successive constitutions, in one way or another, made the effective exercise of political rights dependent in turn on property. Property would define the class of notables who ruled France as electors from the consulate down to the late 19th century. The social profile of property owners was little altered by the revolution. The amount of land held by the nobility inevitably fell, although in the 1800s they still dominated the ranks of the largest and richest proprietors. At the other end of the scale, the sale of national lands especially in the mid-1790s when they had been marketed in small lots, had produced an increase in the number of petty peasant owners, though their overall share scarcely rose. The great gainers from the redistribution of church and noble property were the bourgeoisie, more than anything else, their fears about the security of their gains finally pushed the revolution into the hands of a dictator who imposed stability and offered all property owners unconditional recognition of their title. By the time he fell, their grip on their gains was beyond challenge and the restored bourbons though they returned emigre land still unsold and organized a fund to compensate those whose property had gone, never seriously thought of undoing the land settlement bequeathed by the revolution. The bourgeoisie also gained by the revolution. In the end, as the group from which the professions were recruited, the men of 1789 had proclaimed careers open to the talents, believing that neither birth nor wealth should give privileged access to any employment. At first, the implementation of this principle looked like developing into a disaster for the professions. When venal offices were abolished, compensation was decreed for the property rights thereby suppressed. But it was calculated on the basis of values declared for tax and therefore considerably underestimated. In 1771, before the great inflation of office prices, which marked the last 20 years of the old order, it was also paid largely in depreciating assinats. The dispossessed officers understandably felt cheated. Equally alarming was the revolution's early hostility to professional associations in general, interpreting their commitment to maintaining standards as a hangover from the now abandoned world of corporatism and privilege. This was one of the first abuses of freedom, recalled the distinguished lawyer, that the right was left to anyone without scrutiny or any apprenticeship. 
to practice the liberal professions. Medicine, the bar, and the law in general were thrown open to the market with minimal qualifications required for practitioners. Most of the former validating bodies like universities were abolished in any case. Revolutionary France was therefore a happy hunting ground for quacks and charlatans of every sort. Most of them, and to be sure, members of the bourgeoisie too. Not until Napoleonic times did the state take the situation in hand and reintroduce a rigorous system of licensing to restore professional standards. The solution was more bureaucratic than before 1789, but then so was France. Although hostility to the power of royal administrators had been one of the most universal grievances expressed in the Cahiers of 1789, in the Constitution of 1791 placed almost all responsibility in the hands of elected officials dispensing with the entendants and their professional staffs. As soon as France went to war, this trend was reversed. Central administration employing less than 700 in the 1780s was 6,000 strong by 1794. The overall number of administrators expanded fivefold to about a quarter of a million. Perhaps 10% of the entire bourgeoisie. These numbers fell somewhat in the latter chaotic days of the directory when the ranks of bureaucrats were regularly purged. But they stabilized not far below their 1790s peak under the empire. That supreme administrative government. These numbers fell somewhat in the later chaotic days of the directory. When the ranks of bureaucrats were regularly purged, but they stabilized not far below their 1790s peak under the empire, that supreme administrative government. By then this apparatus had clearer qualifications and rules for entry, a well-established career structure, and even the rudiments of a contributory pension system, a source of livelihood as safe and secure as any investment in landed property. Another group who did well out of the revolution were soldiers. In no sphere were careers thrown more open to the talents. 
as the most successful careerist of them all was all ready to testify. Although military careers continued to attract high numbers of nobles still throughout the 19th century, the aristocratic monopoly of the officer corps had gone forever. Proclaimed in 1789, equal opportunity in the army became a reality far more suddenly than could have been naturally expected when discipline collapsed and a large proportion of officers immigrated over the next two years. By 1793, accordingly, 70% of officers in service had risen from the ranks. Even the officer entry nobles who were left had their promotional chances improved by the departure of so many of their fellows. And for more than two decades after this, the vastly expanded army, first of the great nation, then of the Napoleonic Empire, would offer glory and good prospects to those who joined it and stayed with the colors. It was, of course, dangerous. By 1802, 400,000 French men had fallen in battle, and another, perhaps, would follow them before night fell on the field of Waterloo. The thousands of draft dodgers and deserters who evaded each call up showed clearly enough that the Ummi's appeal was far from universal. Yet, there was no mistaking the enthusiasm, commitment, and revolutionary arrogance of the Republic's Ummi's. From the start, soldiers were among the most fervent and extreme revolutionaries, scorning officers who still behaved like aristocrats, lynching generals suspected of treachery, cheering on de-Christianization, and vigorously imposing the bracing discipline of liberty on defeated enemies. By 1795 and 96, the opportunities for looting and plunder were limitless. And those lucky enough to be in the Ummi of Italy had the unique privilege of being paid in coin. By 1797, the Ummi saw themselves in the former sans culotte mantle as guardians of the revolution's purity standing ready to intervene in domestic politics under any successful general who would mouth slogans about saving the republic from feckless babblers. When eventually the luckiest of such generals took power, military style was imposed on the state. When Lord Cornwallis, the British peace negotiator and an experienced soldier himself, visited a sitting on the legislative body in 1801, he was embarrassed to find his entry and departure marked by a roll of drums and throughout Napoleon's rule. Whether as members of the Legion of Honor or of the Imperial Nobility, soldiers would stand first in the consular and then Imperial hierarchy. The ease with which the returned Emperor put together a new army in 1815 shows how much soldiers felt they owed to the new order. 
landowners, the bourgeoisie, bureaucrats, soldiers, all these groups did well out of the revolution. Taking advantage of the circumstances it had brought about. Certain others benefited from deliberate and conscious acts of emancipation. Most prominent among them were the Protestants. Although the monarchy had been moving towards a more tolerant attitude with its grant of civil status in 1787, French Protestants welcomed the revolution almost unanimously as their true benefactor. Proclaiming as it did freedom of thought and worship and full equality of civil rights between all French citizens. They were quick to lay claim to these rights too with inflammatory results in the cities of the South where old Catholic elites lost power as a result. Their triumph there merely confirmed their age-old reputation in Catholic eyes as subversives and troublemakers. Their early commitment did not save them in 1793 from the ravages of terror and dechristianization. Many came, became involved in the Federalist Revolt in the Guard, and 46 were condemned in the reprisals which followed. In the cities, churches opened only a couple of years earlier. Often, in premises formerly the property of the Catholic Church, were closed or transformed into temples of reason. While in the Seven, Calvinism's rural heartland, the ranks of pastors were decimated by renunciation of order. But there were no Protestant martyrs, and under the directory, practice revived more slowly than among Catholics. Post Fructidorian laws against public worship affected Protestants more severely than Catholics, too, since they outlawed their traditional open air worship in the desert while disproportionate numbers were seduced from their faith by the pale revel rationalities of theophilanthropy. Yet, the annexation of Geneva in 1798 added the most famous Calvinist center of all to French territory. And consular realism refused to countenance any return to Catholic legal dominance. In fact, under Bonaparte, the Protestant churches were established on a parallel basis to the Catholic with salaried pastors. In the process, many of their more democratic traditions were lost in isolated communities left uncatered for. The return of the Bourbons in 1815 sparked a new white terror too in the guard where Catholic triumphalism took revenge on Protestants 
for tribulations reaching back to 1790 but by then there was not going back on the rights and status according to Protestants at the start of the revolution and confirmed by Bonaparte when he ended it The revolution also brought emancipation to France's 39,000 Jews. Here again, there had been signs of change before 1789. The name of Grégoire first came to public notice when, in 1784, he won the Academy of Metz essay competition on the theme of how the lot of Jews could be improved. In the same year, a number of legal disadvantages borne by the Jews of Alsace were lifted. And when the revolution began, the government was planning further concessions in what it and Jewish leaders too regarded as a natural corollary to the moves in favor of Protestants. Yet, the National Assembly proved in much less of a hurry to grant Jews the full rights of French citizens. When the issue was debated, which it was not until the last days of 1789, it became clear that many did not regard them as French at all, or at least not the unassimilated Yiddish speaking Ashkenazim of Alsace who made up nine tenths of the Jewish population accordingly the latter did not benefit from the first emancipation decree of January 1790 not until the very end of the constituent 27 September 1791 where they admitted to full citizenship against the vocal opposition of the Alsatian future director Rubel. Strictly speaking, de-Christianization could not be applied to Jews, but the practice of their religion was still persecuted in 1793 and 94 by the Montagnard zealots of Alsace who remembered that Jewish fanaticism and superstition were as much condemned by Voltaire and other prophets of progress as undiminished popular prejudice. Prejudice remained when terror ended. <clears throat> in fact, it was exacerbated by the arrival in the late 1790s of a new wave of Ashkenazim from Germany attracted by the superior status their fellows in France now enjoyed. Not, however, until 1805 did the government intervene again in Jewish affairs. And then Napoleon's aim was to consolidate their position as citizens, if only by imposing closer state control on their activities. There was to be no return to the marginal status of before the 1780s much to the disgust of the anti-Semites who continue to be found throughout French society. Finally, reluctantly and belatedly, 
the revolution also abolished slavery. In contrast to the case of Protestants and Jews, there was little expectation of change in this sphere before 1789. Although most of the philosophes had condemned slavery and the trade which sustained it, the first French abolition society, the Ami des Noirs, was not founded by Brassad until 1788. Only a handful of Cahiers mentioned the issue, and the defenders of slavery were well organized and funded by the wealth of the colonial trade. They dominated the colonial committee of the National Assembly. But when the Assembly voted in July 1789 to admit unconvoked deputies from Saint Domingo, it did so only after a long and bitter debate about whom they represented. It had raised the question of the political rights of the numerous and increasingly well-organized free colored population, not to mention the black slaves. And whereas its decision made, the assembly passed on to pressing metropolitan business. The impact, <coughs> the impact on the colony itself was volcanic. Struggles for political control now began there between whites and free coloreds, culminating in an uprising of the latter in October 1790, which the whites put down with great brutality, breaking its leader Gay on the wheel. News of these clashes provoked a new debate in Paris, and in May 1791, the Assembly, at the urging of deputies like Grégoire and Robespierre, granted civil rights to colors born of two free parents. It was the revolution's first gesture towards racial equality. But before news of it could reach San Domingo, the slaves, stirred up by the ferocity of the political conflicts around them, had risen in the Great Rebellion of August 1791. It was the progress of this uprising that force the pace on racial issues. In April 1792, the legislative, on which Brissot was the most prominent member, granted full rights to all free colors, regardless of parentage. But when commissioners sent out to enforce the new law arrived in the colony, they found the situation so envenomed that it made little impact. Within months of their arrival, France was at war with Great Britain and communications with home perilous. Willy-nilly, the commissioners were forced to use their own initiative in responding to a complex and shifting situation. Thus, 
while on arrival they loudly reaffirmed the commitment of what was now the French Republic to slavery. By the beginning of February 1793, Commissioner saint Honax was beginning to denounce aristocrats of the skin. The latter responded by trying to drive the commissioners from the colony by force. Only non-whites defended Sothonax, and in recognition of this, in June 1793, he offered freedom to all blacks who would fight for the republic. It is, he declared with the natives of the country that is the Africans that we will save San Domingo for France. Two months later, as Spaniards from the other part of the island invaded the troubled colony, he took the final step. On 29 August, slavery itself was abolished in the northern province. In October, general freedom was proclaimed for all San Domingo. None of this had been authorized by the convention. In fact, in July, after the purge of the Girondines, the commissioners had been recalled as associates of the now discredited Brissot. But when news of the emancipation arrived in Paris in January 1794, the convention greeted it with enthusiasm. If only because, like Sothonax, the deputies saw it as a way to defeat the Republic's British and Spanish enemies in the Caribbean. On 4th of February, accordingly, the convention framed its own decree. Negro slavery was abolished in all French colonies, and all men living there were citizens with full rights. The effect was dramatic. As soon as the news arrived in the colony late in April, black rebel leaders began to rally to the Republic. The free black Toussaint L'Overture, who had joined the Spanish invaders, switched sides. The Spaniards were driven out by black forces, who proceeded to massacre whites who had welcomed the invaders. Under the peace of 1795, Spain ceded all of Hispaniola to France. Terrified whites now appealed to the British, who with slave unrest spreading to their own islands were anxious to stamp it out as its source. There had been British troops in San Domingo since 1793, and now they were reinforced. But newly drafted in from Europe, for the most part, they died like flies in the pestiferous climate. They withdrew in 1798 with nothing to show but 13,000 dead. Many ex-slaves, meanwhile, had been militarized under Toussaint, Toussaint, and they used their power to persecute and terrorize the coloreds. Toussaint remained loyal to France 
But beyond French control under peace with England reopened the seas, as soon as it did so, Bonaparte took characteristically vigorous steps to reassert metropolitan authority, dispatching an army which captured Toussaint and sent him a prisoner to Europe. But the French troops were soon as ravaged by disease as their British predecessors. And when word arrived that the first consul had decreed the reestablishment of slavery in May 1802, black leaders who had been only too willing to betray Toussaint resumed their resistance. And the renewal of war between Great Britain and France cut communications once more. Slavery lasted, restored in French colonies down to 1848, but it was never reestablished in San Domingo, which proclaimed itself on 1st of January, 1880, 1804. Years of bloody vicissitude lay ahead for the new state. Within 18 months of Toussaint's death in a prison in the Jura Mountains in 1803, one of his former lieutenants, Dessalines, was proclaiming himself an emperor and decreeing a new massacre of whites. Yet, French control over the former richest colony in the world was never regained. Haiti was thus the only truly independent state to come into being as a result of the French Revolution. Within a few years, of course, much of Latin America would be proclaiming its independence from a Spain made impotent by French invasion. But it was the revolution's heir and not the movement itself who precipitated the break when he deposed the legitimate dynasty in Madrid. Even so, much of the imagery and language employed by the founders of Latin America independence was derived from the revolution. With their declarations of rights, constitutions, and tricolores, at least one of their leaders, Miranda, had served the Republic as a general and had been dreaming of revolutionizing his native continent since the 1780s and by the time they came into the open ideas of national freedom and independence which they proclaimed were well established among France's European neighbors the impact and influence of the revolution on Europe beyond France were far from exhausted by the mid-1800s, but already the old landscape was scarcely recognizable. Whole states had been permanently swept away. French power had obliterated famous city republics like Geneva, Genoa, and most spectacular of all, Venice. When the revolution had apparently reduced France to helplessness, predatory neighbors had carved up her old ally, Poland. The basis of other states, like the Dutch Republic or Switzerland, had been radically transformed and would be again 
when the Emperor Napoleon decided to set up a satellite kingdom even beyond French reach. The pro-French uprising in Ireland in 1798 had precipitated the end of Irish legislative independence from Great Britain. The Holy Roman Empire would limp on until 1806, finally destroyed by yet another Austrian defeat at French hands. From 1797, however, from the moment the Peace of Campo Formio conceded the left bank of the Rhine to France, it was clear that the empire's traditional composition could not survive. Princes dispossessed there would have to be compensated with territory elsewhere in Germany taken from ecclesiastical rulers. And so they were when the settlement of Campo Formio was confirmed after the Peace of Lunéville. The states of Germany were completely secularized just three years before the empire itself finally crumbled. Imposed on Europe by French power, these changes outlasted it. After the defeat of Napoleon, however, France lost most of the gains she had made for herself. Even within her self-proclaimed natural boundaries, Belgium became part of a new kingdom of the Netherlands and then after 1831, a separate realm in her own right. Luxembourg became an independent Grand Duchy, Austria. More than content with gains in Italy, wanted neither back. Prussia inherited most of the Rhenish left bank for nobody dreamed of reinstating the ecclesiastical princes. Even Savoy was restored to a reconstituted Piedmontese kingdom of Sardinia. Of these losses, France only recovered Savoy in 1860. The long-term gainers from the wars launched by the French revolutionaries against Europe, in fact, were the enemies they were so confident of destroying. The Austrians, having shown an almost miraculous ability to recover in the face of repeated apparently decisive defeats, emerged hugely expanded in territory and would dominate Central Europe for half a century. The Prussians, when they faced French armies squarely for the first time since Valmy in 1806, were shatteringly defeated, but they emerged with the hegemony of Northern Germany first forged by Frederick the Great enormously strengthened and far more extensive territories. Russia and Spain, for their part, demonstrated the practical limitations of even French military power. Napoleon's failure to subdue either marked the beginning of the French Empire's decline. Above all, the British remained invulnerable beyond the Channel. Even in the face of an attempt to exclude their merchandise from Europe, 
first experimented with by the directory and developed into a full-blown system by Napoleon. Meanwhile, they subsidized France's continental enemies and used their sea power to strengthen their already formidable trading links with the rest of the world and systematically destroy or appropriate the assets of their rivals. French occupation completed the economic decline of the Dutch, long overtaken by England but still a substantial power in the 1780s in trade, colonies, finance, and banking. Most of this power drained away to London while Amsterdam was governed from Paris. But Great Britain's greatest economic competitor throughout the 18th century had been France herself. It seems unlikely that she should have kept up economically even if the revolution had not occurred. From the early 1780s, the British were showing signs of moving decisively ahead in volume of trade and industrial production. But the revolution widened the gap irrevocably, the British appropriating the overseas markets and resources that France lost militarily when France became bogged down in the Iberian Peninsula. British sea power at last found a way of directly influencing the continental struggle by transporting an army there. Under the general who would eventually impose the decisive military defeat on Napoleon. Appropriately, Wellington's victory took place in Belgium, the territory for which Great Britain had entered the war in the first place. Intervention in the same cause in 1914 would herald the end for Great Britain of the century of world power which opened with the defeat of France. The French Empire defeated in 1815 was no longer, of course, the country which had begun the war. But then the victorious powers had changed extraordinarily too. Every state which survived confrontation with revolutionary France was deeply marked by the effort. The Republic from 1793 onwards had committed itself to mobilizing the entire resources of Europe's most populous country, Russia accepted. The monarchies against whom this drive was directed could only hope to defeat it if they did the same. Mass warfare resulted involving huge armies and whole populations no longer insulated as they had been during a century and a half of contain contained warfare for limited objectives from the full impact of military demands. As Clausewitz, whose great whose whole great theory of war was based upon analysis of the conflicts between 1792 and 1815 put it. In 1793, such a force as no one had any conception of made its appearance. War had again suddenly become an affair of the people.
in that of a people numbering 30 millions, every one of whom regarded himself as a citizen of the state. By this participation of the people in the war, a whole nation with its natural weight came into the scale. Henceforth, the means available the efforts which might be called forth had no longer any definite limits. The element of war, freed from all conventional restrictions, broke loose with all its natural force. The cause was the participation of the people in this great affair of state. And this participation arose partly from the effects of the French Revolution on the internal affairs of the countries, partly from the threatening attitude of the French towards all nations. But these changes needed to be organized. And nothing could be done if the government did not take extensive new powers. Everywhere, for example, conscriptions of some sort became the norm. Introduced into the Austrian hereditary lands under Maria Theresia in 1802, it was extended to Hungary after the defeat of the old Prussian professional and half mercenary Ummi in 1806, a new land war began to be organized, based for the first time largely on the state's own citizens. While the spirit of the levee en masse was sought in the creation of a popular force of resistance to invasion, the land's term in Great Britain balloting for the militia and other auxiliary forces was extended. There were riots throughout Ireland when a militia was introduced for the first time in 1793. The same in Scotland in 1797 and the activities of the press gang in the ports of the British Isles were a source of constant tension. These governments seldom made the French mistake of equating resistance to conscription with treason and sympathy with the enemy. But fears that, Jacob, that genuine Jacobins would exploit the resentments it caused, among other popular grievances, led to a general increase in police activities and numbers. And spies and informers proliferated. The burden of taxation, of course, rose spectacularly and much ingenuity was displayed everywhere in finding new commodities to impose levies on. The first self-confessed income tax was introduced in Great Britain in 1799. And soon afterwards, a similar levy was introduced in Austria. Nor were the Asinats the only paper money to be issued and depreciated. By 1800, 200 million bank cosettel were circulating in Austria, and by 1804 had lost 35%. And yet, except in Ireland in 1798, resistance to more burdensome government in states fighting France never attained the scale and persistence witnessed there. This was because, in the end, the subjects of Europe's beleaguered kings and emperors feared and hated the French 
more than they did their own rulers. What they learned of French behavior in occupied territories did nothing to reassure them. An exuberant, uncompromising nationalism lay behind France's revolutionary expansion in the 1790s. But what the French found after this first impact of a nation in arms on its neighbors was that the neighbors responded in kind. They found that the doctrine of the sovereignty of the nation proclaimed by them at the outset of the revolution in 1789 could be turned against them by other peoples claiming their own national sovereignty in states long united by custom and language such as the Dutch Republic all the French example did was to reinforce patriotic sentiments already strong in areas never before united like Italy it created a powerful national sentiment for the first time by showing that archaic barriers and divisions could be swept away. The first Italian nationalists placed their hopes in French power to secure their ends. But from the start, their attitude was double-edged. Italy declared the winning entry for an essay competition on the best form of Italian government sponsored by the new French regime in Milan in 1796, has almost always been the patrimony of foreigners who, under the pretext of protecting us, have consistently violated our rights and, while giving us flags and fine-sounding names, have made themselves masters of our estate. France, Germany, and Spain have held lordship over us in turn. It is therefore best to provide the sort of government capable of opposing the maximum of resistance to invasion. The tragedy for nationalistic Italian Jacobins was that when popular revulsion against the French invaders swept the peninsula in 1798 and 99, they found themselves identified with the hated foreigners. Elsewhere, peoples and intellectual nationalists found themselves more at one and not the least of the reasons why France's most inveterate enemies were able to resist her so successfully was the strength of volunteering. An Austrian call for volunteers against the French produced 150,000 men in 1809 Three years later, the Russians were able to supplement their normal armed forces with over 420,000 more, or less willing recruits to drive out the alien invader. Only nationalism could successfully fight nationalism, and when it did, as Clausewitz again saw, it would be a fight to the death. Wars of peoples could admit of none of the old limited bargained conclusions of palmated dynasts. These would be the wars of the future, and the French Revolution had pioneered them. It was ironic that a movement that so fired and hardened national antagonisms should have been launched in the name of the universal rights of man. It was even more surprising that these values should have remained associated with the French cause when revolutionary France herself 
had turned away from most of them, but apart from French puppets, no other European state dreamed of espousing the revolutionary ideology. They knew that, whereas French power threatened their existence, French principles challenged their legitimacy. <clears throat> Yet for all their efforts, and Napoleon's too, sooner or later, much of this ideology still triumphed. The message of the French Revolution was that the people are sovereign. <clears throat> and in the two centuries since it was first proclaimed, it has conquered the world. What it means in practice is subject to constant disagreement and was from the start. Representative government after properly held elections was one thing, but the deputy who declared on 15 June 1789 as he pointed to the screaming public galleries, learn that we are deliberating here in front of our masters and we are, una are answerable to them for our opinions was asking for trouble. In 1792, it arrived when the much feared tumultuous democracy warned against by men of order since the beginning triumphed amid the bloodshed of the storming of the Tuileries and the September massacres. The people were now in power. Also, the sans culotte and their Montagnard allies claimed for the first time since antiquity. Later Democrats have looked back on those months as the first triumph of their defeat, of their beliefs, Yet, at the time, most men of property and education were horrified, and they continued to be haunted by the memory down the generations. In the end, the activities of the sans culotte probably retarded rather than advanced the cause of mass democracy. Nevertheless, Prescription and hereditary right would never again command unchallenged consent on a basis for legitimate political authority. Sooner or later, even the most absolute monarchs or dictators would feel the need to confirm their right to power with a show of popular endorsement. More often than not, perhaps, Elections or plebiscites would be rigged. The French revolutionaries pioneered that technique too. But since 1789, ever dwindling numbers of regimes have felt it wise to do without any token of consent from those over whom they rule. If asked to sum up their cause in one word, the men of 1789, and perhaps most of their compatriots down to 1802, would have responded. Liberty in revolutionary France and in the countries France overran, the image of, imagery of liberty was everywhere. Phrygian caps, allegorical statues, and above all liberty trees planted by triumphant Jacobins and as often as not hacked down later by counter-revolutionaries. 60,000 had been planted by 1792. After 1792, 
the trappings of Roman republicanism became fashionable. With fasces and axes and stern ancient patriots like Brutus, Scaevola, and Cato. <coughs> Familiar to all men of education were much invoked. But what did liberty mean? In everyday practice, it appeared to mean whatever those in power wanted. For them, Rousseau's statement that legitimate authorities should force men to be free was wonderfully convenient. And in the year number two, sophistries of this sort were littered in the speeches of more speculative rhetoricians like Robespierre and St. Just. Abroad, liberty simply meant French rule. Yet, <clears throat> less equivocal definitions were available and had been offered by the revolutionaries at the outset. It was defined in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen as the right to do anything that did not harm others, limited only by others' enjoyment of the same right. It also meant freedom from arbitrary power, which meant by 1792 was being routinely identified as the power of any king. Finally, it meant freedom to think, write, and worship as one chose. <clears throat> Although it was soon limiting them in practice, the revolution never ceased to pay copious lip service to these values. They would remain inseparable from the creed of all those subsequently inspired by the French revolutionary myth. The same was true of the second key to the rights of man, equality. If we know nothing else about the French revolution, we know that it spawned the famous motto adopted for the state by the Third Republic and never abandoned since, except by the Vichy regime. Liberty, equality, fraternity. In historical fact, fraternity came late. Appearing only in 1793 and went soon being largely abandoned by the end of 1794 as a now redundant sop to the sans culotte. Equality, however, was there from the beginning. All men proclaimed the declaration, are born and remain free and equal in rights. Social distinctions can only be based on common utility. And the law should be the same for everybody. By these tokens, a society based on privilege, hereditary superiority, or feudal prerogatives was renounced. And the revolutionaries of France offered a complete program for other societies wishing to do the same. Yet the equality aimed at by the men of 1789 had very clear limits. Equality of opportunity expressed as careers open to the talents was one thing. Equality of fortunes or property which alone could make true equality of opportunity a reality was quite another. <clears throat> 
and never espoused by more than a tiny handful of political activists. In the 1790s, property, indeed, and the security that went with it was proclaimed as one of the natural and imprescriptible rights of man. In March 1793, the convention, amid scenes of general enthusiasm, decreed the death penalty for anybody proposing an agrarian law. A forcible redistribution of property of the sort familiar to all the deputies from reading at school about the ill-fated Gracchi in Republican Rome. Equality of political rights commanded more support, especially in 1793 through 4. But it is hard to decide how much of the democratic talk heard then was intended more to impress the sans culotte than as an expression of real conviction. Certain it is that the only constitution of the 1790s to fix no property qualifications for voting or eligibility at any level, that of 1793, was never brought into force and abandoned as impractical as soon as popular pressure on the convention eased. The constitution makers of 1795 did not resurrect the category of active citizen elaborated in 1790, but they put effective voting power, that of the secondary assemblies, squarely in the hands of substantial property owners. The consular lists would observe the same principles, defining the political nation in effect as the notables. Not until 1848 was the principle challenged again. Equality between men and women, meanwhile, was brushed aside as scarcely worth consideration. Despite the unprecedented part women had played in public affairs in and after 1789, Whether marching to Versailles to bring back the royal family in October 1789 or urging on their menfolk to take more decisive action in most of the subsequent journeys down to Prairie Hall in 1795 or whether forming as nuns the most solid block of clergy to refuse the clerical oath or leading the steady drift back to the religious observance over the late 1790s, women at crucial points were of decisive importance in the revolution. Invariably, their intervention pushed matters to extremes. Gregoire, despairing at popular refusal to patronize his rump constitutional church, cannot have been the only one to lament the influence of crapulous and seditious women. Meanwhile, whereas the highest level, the closest influence of political wives like Mademoiselle Roland and Mademoiselle Tallien or Necker's busybody daughter, Mademoiselle de Stael, continued the well-established traditions of the old regime the unprecedented atmosphere of revolutionary Paris threw up new and unusual figures. There was Thayer Oigne de Mericor sitting among the men at the Jacobin Club in her national guard uniform. 
rallying the faint-hearted at the Tuileries on 10 August, perhaps spying for the Emperor and eventually beaten into terminal insanity by her female political enemies, or Claire Lacombe, actress and enrage, who organized a club of revolutionary Republican citizenesses who fought pitched battles with market women who refused to wear the revolutionary cockade. They were so disorderly that on 30 October 1793, the convention formally banned women's organizations. Or there was Olympe de Gouge, playwright and pamphleteer who attacked Robespierre and offered to defend the king and failed to avoid the guillotine by feigning pregnancy at 45 after being arrested for demanding government by plebiscite. In 1791, she had written a pamphlet the rights of women and the citizen in which she laid claim to equal political rights with men but there was never any hope of that the men of the French Revolution had vivid memories of the malign influence of royal mistresses presumptuous salon hostesses not to mention an empty headed queen under the old regime women in public life all this showed what dangerous <clears throat> whether at the top or as experience after 1789 proved in the streets the role of women they felt should be exclusively that of wives and mothers bearing children for the homeland believing politics to men in this respect Napoleon was entirely typical in many of his interventions during the drafting of the Civil Code were directed at restricting women's property rights. He would not have dissented from the advice offered to women by the Jacobin journalist Prudhomme in 1793. Be honest and diligent, girls. Tender and modest wives, wise mothers, and you will be good patriots. True patriotism consists of fulfilling one's duties and valuing only rights appropriate to each according to sex and age. And not wearing the liberty cap and pantaloons. And not carrying pike and pistol. Leave those to men who are born to protect you and make you happy. The practical egalitarianism of the French Revolution was therefore quite narrow. Even so, the revolution also produced the most radical and imaginative attempt to achieve equality yet seen in history. Babeuf's Conspiracy of Equals the revolution produced the most radical and imaginative attempt to achieve equality yet seen in history. Babeuf's Conspiracy of Equals. Designed to achieve one of the fundamental rights of man. It drew its inspiration from another endorsed by the declarations both of 1789 and 1793 resistance to oppression for one thing revolutionaries could never do was proclaim revolution itself illegitimate every regime down to 1814 could trace its title back no further than the seizure of sovereignty by the representatives of the nation in june 1789 confirmed by the popular action of mid-July. Thus, 
declared the 1793 Declaration of Rights. When the government violates the rights of the people, insurrection is for the people. And for each portion of the people, the most sacred of rights and the most indispensable of duties. Exercising this right, a second revolution within the revolution had overthrown the monarchy in August 1792 and discontented elements for the whole span of the First French Republic regarded rebellion as a legitimate if final recourse against regimes they believe to be violating the rights of man. It was a reflex that would become permanently entrenched in French history and soon enough in that of the whole world. The modern idea of revolution goes back no further than 1789. But once it had occurred in France, the idea that it was possible and right to overthrow an existing order by force and on grounds of general principles rather than existing law was launched. Simultaneously, a new figure appeared on the stage of history, the revolutionary. There had been no revolutionaries before 1789. Nobody expected, foresaw, or planned for the catastrophe that began then. The revolutionaries of France were created by the revolution. But that never happened again. Afterwards, revolutions would be consciously prepared for. And even when their form or occasion was unexpected, as in 1917, there were always revolutionaries there with plans laid to take advantage of them. Henceforth, it was recognized that revolutions which were more than just sudden or violent changes at the top could be engineered and succeed. For this new breed, the French Revolution was the classic political and social experience. It provided an inspiration, proof that revolution could occur. It provided a model, what techniques to use, what mistakes to avoid. It provided a style and a language Self-conscious revolutionaries would adopt a tricolor as the flag of liberty, imitate French uniforms, Wolf Tone dreamed of clothing a united Irish National Guard in 1792, and green striped trousers, no culottes, rename streets after the dates of revolutionary events and institute public holidays and ceremonies on anniversaries. As late as 1989, as the bicentenary of the French Revolution was being celebrated throughout the world, student revolutionaries in Beijing sang the Marseillaise around a makeshift statue of liberty as troops prepared to shoot them down. Marx, Lenin, and Trotsky all studied the 1790s as a guide to revolution and what happened or is thought to have happened then occupies a crucial place in the theory of history which underpins Marxism. But the later political influence of the revolution reached far beyond the ranks of revolutionaries. 
the vocabulary of all politics was permanently changed. The categories of left and right go back to the constituent assembly, where radicals soon fell into the habit of sitting together to the left of the chair, while their opponents congregated on the right. Only later did socialists, seeing their own antecedents in the outlook and the ideas of the more extreme revolutionaries, appropriate the left-wing label, and it sometimes seemed lay exclusive claim to the revolutionary heritage. Yet what enabled them to do so was the total rejection of that heritage by the right. Before 1789, conservatism as a positive, self-conscious political outlook scarcely existed. Some Catholic publicists had begun to denounce the Enlightenment for the threat it seemed to pose to all established values. But not until their dire, direst predictions had come true were they widely heeded. By 1793, however, self-proclaimed disciples of the philosophes had elaborated a revolutionary ideology in attacking all the principal pillars of stability, property, social hierarchy, religion, and monarchy. None of these, or their justification in the nature of things, could any longer be taken for granted. They now needed to be defended, both in the theory and in practice. The theoretical task was undertaken by men like Burke, Gintz, or the Savoyard refugee from the French invasion, Joseph de Maistre, who began his denunciations with considerations on France in 1797. The history of the revolution showed, he believed, that too much striving after abstract freedom and rationality led to chaos and anarchy. In fact, as with later Marxists, the whole political outlook of the early right was based on a theory of history. Though theirs was confined much more narrowly to the revolution itself, the key thought Maestre to restoring the order and stability destroyed by the revolution was to restore the other things it had overthrown. Aristocracy, throne, and above all, altar. But once restored, these institutions would need to guard against being subverted once again by the coercion of free thought and revolutionary inspiration. This was the lesson most remembered when the much bruised remnants of the old order emerged from the cataclysm. No compromise. If the revolution was God's punishment on the old regime for countenancing creeping laxity and infidelity, then the best hope for lasting stability in the future was to support religion, avoid representative institutions, control opinion, and maintain vigilance against subversive plots. A whole right-wing political outlook had been born. And like its revolutionary antithesis, it transcended frontiers. It would dominate many 19th century governments, but in the end, they would find that intransigence merely provoked what it hoped to prevent. Reformers were driven to plotting revolution because there was no hope of change in any other way, while hostility to religion and the social order was all the more virulent when in the end, it did break out again. Moderate conservatives feared as much. In every state, there would be those who believed that reform rather than intransigence was the best way to prevent revolution. 
they were not always successful. But at least they were prepared to look reality in the face. For good or ill, the revolution had happened. And the ideals, aspirations, and myths it had inspired could not be expunged from human memory and the world of acceptance which it had shattered could never be artificially recreated. The shadow of the revolution, therefore, fell across the whole of the 19th century and beyond. Until 1917, few would have disputed that it was the greatest revolution in the history of the world. And even after that, its claims to primacy remain strong. It was the first modern revolution, the archetypical one. After, after it, nothing in European world remained the same, and we are all heirs to its influence. And yet, it can be argued much that was attributed to it would in all probability have come about in any case. Before 1789, there were plenty of signs that the structure of French society was evolving towards domination by a single elite in which property counted for more than birth. The century-long expansion of the bourgeoisie which underlay this trend already looked irreversible and greater participation by men of property in government as constant experiments with provincial assembly showed <clears throat> seemed bound to come. Meanwhile, many of the reforms of the revolution brought in were already being tried or thought about by the absolute monarchy. Law codification, fiscal rationalization, diminution of venality, free trade, religious toleration. With all these changes underway or in contemplation, the power of government looked set for steady growth too which ironically was one of the complaints of the despotism-obsessed men of 1789. In the church, the monastic ideal was already shriveling in the status of parish priests, commending more and more public sympathy. Economically, the colonial trade had already peaked, and failure to compete industrially with Great Britain was increasingly manifest in other structural areas. Meanwhile, the great upheaval appears to have made no difference at all. Conservative investment habits still characterize the early 19th century agricultural inertia and unentrepreneurial business likewise. And in international affairs, it is hard to believe that Great Britain would not have dominated the world seas and trade throughout the 19th century, that the Austro-Prussian rivalry would not have run much the course it did, or the Latin America would not have asserted its independence in some form or other if the French Revolution had never happened. In all these fields, the effect was ex to accelerate or retard certain trends but not to change their general drift. Against all this, it is equally hard to believe that the specifically anti-aristocratic, anti-feudal revolutionary ideology of the rights of man would have emerged as it did without the jumble of accident, miscalculation, and misunderstanding which coalesced into a revolution in specifically French circumstances. It is equally hard to believe that 
anything in extraordinary as a de-Christianization would have occurred without the monumental misjudgment which produced the revolution's quarrel with the Catholic Church. Without the quarrel, the dramatic revival in the authority of the papacy also seems inconceivable. Representative government may well have been on the horizon, but how long would the ideal of popular democracy have taken to establish itself without the example of the sans culotte movement? It certainly transformed and widened out of all recognition the cause of parliamentary reform in England. Although the blood-stained figure of the sans culotte probably galvanized conservative resistance on the other side, above all, the revolutionaries' decision to go to war, which all historians agree revolutionized the revolution, destroyed an established pattern of warfare in a way no regime government would otherwise have promoted. Arming the people was the last thing they would have dreamed of. The emergencies of that war, in turn, produced the scenes which have indelibly marked our memory of the revolution. The terror. Massacres were nothing new, and the worst ones of the 1790s occurred outside France. But there was something horribly new and unimaginable in this prospect of a government systematically executing its opponents by the cartload for months on end. And by a device which, however humane in concept, made the streets run with blood. And this occurred in what had passed for the most civilized country in Europe whose writers had taught the 18th century to pride itself on its increasing mildness, good sense, and humanity. This great drama transformed the whole meaning of political change in the contemporary world would be inconceivable if it had not happened. In other words, it was a profound cultural transformation. The writers of the Enlightenment, so revered by the intelligentsia who made the revolution, had always believed it could be done if men dared to seize control of their own destiny. The men of 1789 did so in a rare moment of courage, altruism, and idealism, which took away the breath of educated Europe. What they failed to see, as their inspirers had not foreseen, was that reason and good intentions were not enough by themselves to transform the lot of humanity. Mistakes would be made when the accumulated experience of generations was pushed aside as so much routine, prejudice, fanaticism, and superstition. The generation forced to live through the upheavals of the next 26 years pay the price. Already, by 1802, a million French citizens lay dead. A million more would perish under Napoleon and untold more abroad. How many millions more still had their lives ruined? inspiring and ennobling the prospect of the French Revolution is also moving and appalling. 
in every sense a tragedy.